Hey weirdos, I just wanted to plop a little content warning in here, a little trigger warning, because we are going to be discussing quite a bit of suicide in this episode. So if that makes you squeamish, if you can't handle it, I totally get it. Um, You can go ahead and skip around to about the 40 minute mark and then you'll be in the clear. Anyway, hope you enjoy. This podcast is created for adult audiences only and contains content that may be alarming to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised. Any badass views or opinions about to hear are those of the hosts that do not represent those of the people, institutions, or organizations that the podcast may or may not be associated with. So just don't be a dick. You know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I was going to say konnichiwa, but have I said konnichiwa already? I think you've done it like two times. <laughs> konnichiwa, you I've can... done twice. Yes. <laughs> konnichiwa, motherfuckers. <laughs> um, uh, hasta luego. Uh, I don't remember what that means. <laughs> I think it's probably like, see you later. This is the end. <laughs> uh, welcome to Girls Gone Weird. I'm Nicole. And I'm Denny, and I think you did an awesome job with our entry today. Thank you. <laughs> it was a little all over the place, but it that's works. okay. It's it okay. Works. I started pre-gaming a little bit beforehand, which is a little redundant because pre means before anyway. So mm-hmm. I was just can say I was pre-gaming, but I uh, I made a very odd drink for tonight. Ooh. It is my another th- none other than. Forty dollar bottle of tequila. Yep, every time. Forty dollar bottle of with... tequila. <laughs> every time. If yep. if it's never that, if it's never not that, just mm-hmm. like something's wrong, come send somebody to my house. Um, it's my forty dollar tequila mixed with watermelon IV water <laughs> and Ooh. a splash of cherry Kool Aid juice. <laughs> I and got you into the Kool Aid. You, I thought about you. I was like, I'm gonna put some mm-hmm. Kool Aid in here for her, and then yeah. a little bit of Fentman's Rose Lemonade. Nice. So it's a real odd mixture. I can't describe the taste to you because it's real unique. Yeah, it's like yeah. rose, cherry, and watermelon. Cherry rose and watermelon. coconut because the and tequila coconut. is coconut. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little tropical. It honestly sounds like something they make in New Orleans. Because all the drinks in New Orleans were just like all just fucking tons of like really sweet juices, and they were all fucking yeah. disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, you this one like pretty them. sweet. <laughs> it's pretty, I usually don't really like sweet, like super sweet, and this is super sweet. But it's weird. It's it's got a weird taste to it, so I'm kind of digging it. I don't know. We'll see. It will be our drink for the episode. <laughs> yes, our we'll call it coffee. the. I don't I don't know what we'll call it yet. I've, I'll think of something witty. <laughs> a drink that will take you weird places. <laughs> an odd, an odd ball. Not a screwball, but an odd ball. I like that. There you go. Odd ball. An odd ball. It's an odd ball. Perfect. Well, I am super, super excited for this episode. Last episode, we got real dark. Yep. Um, there has been mixed, mixed opinions on, on if Albert Fish or if Dean Coral is more fucked who's up. winning who's winning the most fucked up as of right now fishy oh yeah she's winning yep he's winning but there's definitely mm-hmm. some people that are like fuck the candy man including our friend kevin blue jeans son Ooh. you know yep. he is from fort wayne indiana Ooh, where the candy where man? dan coral's from yes so they're basically related so. exactly and they he's never heard of them either huh he had never heard of them. what is with this no, guy he was like this is fucked. Yeah. I'm glad I got him out. We should just, you know, they both lived in Fort Wayne. We should just have him on, on for an interview. Yeah. Because that's enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's plenty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we got super dark. It was fucked up. Classic, classic yeah. Denny episode. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I delivered. I am stoked about tonight, though. This is, uh, we have not done one like this yet, I believe. Have we? We haven't, but we will have ones 
like it in the future. This is just going to be volume one of many to come, I hope. Yes. <laughs> and why don't you tell us what we are talking about tonight? Drum roll. Weird or odd places. Odd places, odd places. on planet Earth. Yes. Yep. So I think that uh, it's going to be super fun because obviously there's so many odd places mm-hmm. around our lovely planet. Uh, so it was hard to narrow them down. But you chose a beast. So you're doing just one. Yep. But I have two smaller ones. So we're going to sandwich you in between me. It'll be a Denny Chol sandwich. Perfect. Yeah, because I was going to do I had like three I wanted to do right away. And then I yep. started doing this one and I'm like, OK, nope. Got a little crazy here because that's what I do. I go a little crazy with research. And I honestly thought that the one you chose might be like, that's a full episode or this place. So we'll see. We'll see how long this episode gets. I'm sure if you're listening, you already know because you can see. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I'm going to start first and then and then you can go into yours. Let's do it. And, yeah. and I don't know what Nicole is doing, so I'm excited. Yep, I only know what she's doing because I didn't want to duplicate her. So I was like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a complete surprise, and I'm very curious to hear if you've heard about either of these places. Yeah. So I'm going to set the scene a little bit here. So a mm-hmm. uh, couple thousand years ago, uh, Mount Fuji in Japan experienced its last major eruption, which was a super violent six month long eruption that buried like entire villages. It was, it was insanely huge. Um, and it also happened to form roughly 12 square miles of hardened lava, which eventually transformed into the incredibly dense forest that we know today as Aokigahara, which is sometimes called Jukai or Sea of Trees by the locals. Or possibly known even better by the English moniker, the Suicide Forest. I'm sure you can guess why. Yes, I love it already. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't. But I am surprised already that trees can grow out of lava. (laughs) It's insane. That's amazing. I I can't wait to see it. I want to see pictures. Yes, everybody look at our episode post right now and pause if you need to look at it. Because this place is incredible. Um... It'll be it would be awesome for you to take a peek before you listen to the story so you can really yeah. like put yourself it, in it. it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna set the scene for the people that cannot oh, it's look at it is gorgeous, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'll set the scene for everybody that can't like go on their phones and look immediately. Maybe you're driving or maybe you're fucking or whoever knows what you're doing. <laughs> you're fucking you us in the time. background. <laughs> I would please somebody tell me. Yeah. Oh my god. That would be amazing. I'd feel so honored. <laughs> I would too. I would too. But maybe that's one reason why you can't Google photos of this. So I will tell you what you would be seeing if you're in this forest. So when I say this forest is dense, I mean it is dense. Like she thick. She a a thick thick. thick girl. (laughs) Um, It's denseness. uh, Like like it prohibits the wind from rustling the moss covered trees, along with the fact that the lava rock absorbs sound. So it gives this forest sort of like an eerie silence and stillness. Um, And because the trees grew from hardened lava, like we just talked about, it causes a ton of the roots to look like twisted and gnarled because they couldn't penetrate any deeper than usual, you know, because lava. Yep. Very Harry Potter. Yeah, it only adds to the ambience, really. Um, And because of the flow of lava leaving the ground with an uneven surface before hardening, there's like a lot of these cave like gaping holes and like the partially uprooted trees that have formed in the ground. So like you could be just walking up a hill and there's just these jagged rocks and then there's just a like a really thin, narrow cave. And who knows what you will see down there? Yeah. So you said Harry Potter. I was going to say, and I know you're going to be like, I think it's a very dreamy, like Lord of the Rings covered landscape. Mm. Totally reminds me of that. Like some orcs are going to like pop out, start murdering you. Um, But it's beautiful. It's beautiful. (laughs) Very mossy. I love everything mossy. Yes. It's so mossy. It's so green. All Mm -hmm. the trees are just packed tight together and they're gnarled and it's just, it's a wild looking place. So You might also notice some other things if you look a little closer. So when you walk in, you'll see signs that are written in Japanese that state things like, think carefully about your children, your family, 
and your life is a precious gift from your parents. Which is a little spooky to read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then so sometimes you'll see string or tape on the trees that leads you off of the path. So these are often signs of people that have like ventured deep into the forest and are contemplating basically not returning. And the string is like a guide for them to find their way back if they change their mind, which hopefully they do. Mm -hmm. But usually if you see that string leading off, you know immediately somebody's gone that direction. Hundreds of times while the forest has been searched, these strings have led to like decrepit tents, nooses left in the trees to decay. And you guessed it even human remains. There are plenty of videos on YouTube that go people go into the forest and most of them are looking for a thrill. But if you want to see some more like respectful explorations, I would steer clear of those sort of big content creators who are sensationalizing it because they're douchey and just find a better video. Don't click on the first one that you see, you know. Mm -hmm. So instead, if you want to search for a guy named Johnny Paranormal, and that's Johnny with one N, and we'll link you over to his YouTube channel. But he explores the forest like incredibly respectfully. Content warning, though, he does find multiple bodies while he searches it oh, multiple wow. times. Yeah. So watch at your own discretion. Do you just call the police type of deal or? Do yeah. Keep in so in, a, in his videos, what he does is he searches basically to help the victims and their families because most of these families don't know mm. what happened to their loved ones because the forest is so dense. You're literally lost in the sea of trees. Yeah. So whenever he finds a body, he contacts the authorities. Sometimes people's like cell phones are just sitting there in their wallets so you can easily identify them. Yeah. So... So, yeah, they the, the police will come like that, but they also do like annual sweeps and stuff like that. I was about to say, since it is a place that this happens often, you would think that authorities would be there often. Oh, like yes. Like going through and just checking and making sure everyone's safe. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to venture to say that if we went there tomorrow and visited and went off the path and put our own strings up, it's very likely that we would find, if not like a fresh body, like a skeleton. Or, you know, something oh, wow. like that's. Yeah. So Aoki Gahara actually has the second highest rate of suicides behind the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, which is number one. Wow. Yeah. Which is funny because some people have never heard of this place and it's the second. Yeah. I hear about the Golden Gate Bridge all the time and they've put like certain um, kind of like wires and stuff. So if you jump, you get stuck. Yep. And you can't fall in and that there's people like their whole job is just to drive a boat underneath there in case someone yeah. jumps so i'm surprised that i haven't heard of this <laughs> it's insane it really is it, and it's been like this for a really really long time since 1970 actually the annual body searches have been carried out in the forest by police volunteers and journalists and each year the body count kept on increasing and around 2011 the japanese government stopped publishing the number of bodies found in the aoki gahara forest to curb the like negative publicity because they just kept releasing it and people just want to keep coming and it's just you know Kind of becoming disrespectful. Yeah, and it's just, it's all negative, <laughs> yeah. and it is still a beautiful forest, you know. Between 1998 and 2003, there were close to 100 annual confirmed suicides in the forest. And the number of actual suicides each year is believed to be much higher, as the sheer size of the forest leads many bodies to be lost to, like, natural decomp, which will just, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about it in our other episodes, just feeds the forest, yeah. you know. So yeah, not not all of them obviously are found during these sweeps. If a fucking YouTuber can just walk off the path and find multiple bodies, you know, it's insane. Yeah. Well, if I was going to go, that would be a beautiful place to go, and I'd be happy that I compost it. Yeah, so, makes yeah. sense. It makes mm -hmm, sense. It does. Um. So it's a little bit of a mystery why the forest has the allure that it does, but there are a ton of theories. Uh, one such theory is the controversial reputation of a book written in 93 by Waturu Surumi called The Complete Manual of Suicide, which sounds delightful. <laughs> yeah. um, according to Wikipedia, the 198-page book provides explicit descriptions and analysis on a wide range of suicide methods and a matter-of-fact assessment of each method in terms of the pain it causes – the effort of preparation required, the appearance of the body, and lethality. That's actually really neat. I don't know why. It's very neat. I would definitely want to read it, but there's definitely other people that might 
Yeah. Like it's not what they need to be reading at the moment, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So I hope you would know if you're in the right mindset to read a book like this. Um, in the postscript, the author says, to think at the worst crucial moment, one can escape from the pain by committing suicide. One can live for the moment easier. So by distributing this book, I want to make this stifling society an easier place to live. That is the goal of this book. And I never intend to encourage readers to commit suicide, which is, you know, OK, I get it. But, you know, despite yeah. the statement, many bodies have been found actually with the complete manual of suicide, either on their person or with their personal effects. Wow. So, yeah, I'd say the author's intent, however innocent, was a little mm -hmm. misinterpreted by people. Um, actually, one of the videos of Johnny Paranormal that he goes in and he finds a body, um, one of them actually had that book in their things. Well, hopefully it wasn't due to that book. And hopefully that book helped them not go through pain during the last minutes of their life. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It it's a again, controversial is the perfect word for it. And I'm one of those weirdos that very much believes in assistant suicide and believes yes. that you should be able to do that. So mm -hmm. yep. not saying you should, but there's a process and yep. you should talk to people about this and this Absolutely. That's a, that's a planned thing, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> um but we yeah, we get it. So some other theories include according to recorded history. Mount Fuji is considered a sacred mountain in Japan, and the forest cover surrounding it is naturally a sacred place. So for years, some Buddhist monks come to the forest to practice an extreme form of meditation. They would bury themselves underground or go without eating anything to continue their meditation until death, which is intense. Yeah. But the ultimate goal is to transform the body while still being alive into something called Soku Shinbutsu, uh, which is basically a type of mummy. That has undergone exactly what they went through to be that kind of mummy, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. So to date, 18 bodies of self-mummified monks have been recovered from Aokigahara and are being displayed in various parts of Japan, which is wild. <laughs> so some other theories, a lot of them are mythological. So this one is based in mythology as well. And it says it's home of the Yurai, which are the Japanese ghosts. Folklore claims they are vengeful and dedicated to tormenting visitors and luring those who are sad and lost off the paths, along with other spirits of those who have taken their lives that just wander the forest for all eternity. Dun, dun, dun. It's a little creepy. Love it. A little creepy. Another theory is romanticism. Basically, stories that romanticize the idea of suicide in the forest. So Very Shakespearean. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So there is a folkloric practice called the obastie, which literally translates to abandoning the old woman. And this is what happens when families abandon their elderly relatives in remote areas during times of famine, which is fucked up. <laughs> You'd be like, sorry, grandma. Drop it off, Grandpa. Like throw him in the country. Yeah, but we can't feed you anymore. We're gonna drop you off. Aoki Kahara. See you later. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. It's fucked up. It, again, this is a folklore, but apparently some believe that that is actually a practice that used to be held. So, oh, well, fuck, fuck those, those old people. Old people. All right. So. We're get old. That's gonna be our angry people this episode. Not for old people. <laughs> this is the episode. Not for old people. <laughs> Maybe they probably don't Fuck want them. us to call them old people. We'll call them the elders. We are not for the elders. <laughs> no. <laughs> so on the topic of romanticism, uh, Japan's most famous writer who is, I'm, I might be slaughtering these Japanese names. I didn't take Japanese in high school. Seicho Matsumoto. I feel like I nailed it, but we'll see. You're, they all sound, you, you're doing a really good job at making them sound right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll just all be confident in it then. Yep. So Seicho Matsumoto commended the Aokigahara forest in his novel Tower of Waves in 1960 as the romanticized setting for suicide by a pair of young lovers. And since then, the forest started appearing in novels and movies as a suicide site. So again, Romanticizing movies, mm -hmm. 
people are starting to catch on. In fact, the uh, 2015 film The Sea of Trees, starring Matthew McConaughey and Naomi Watts, takes place there. As does the 2016 horror film The Forest, starring Natalie Dormer, who people will remember from Game of Thrones and To Kill a Mocking... No, not To Kill a Mockingbird. To Catch... (laughs) To catch a, to kill a, what the fuck is that movie with Jennifer Lawrence? Um, killing a mocking Jay. What is the oh, the Hunger I, Games? The Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> to kill, what was I calling it? Mock. Well, there is a mocking Jay on there, and you Jay. wanted to kind of connect it with to kill a mockingbird. To kill a mockingbird. <laughs> To catch a when mockingbird. you said that, when you were saying it, to kill a mockingbird, I thought that I'm like, wow, she must be really old. <laughs> She's had a big career. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> That's a great movie. Great book, but the movie great is good book. too. Um, no, whatever movie you just said is correct. I yeah, forgot the it. Hunger Forg- Games. Forgotten yep. it already. The Hunger Games. I've seen it or them a couple They're times fantastic. at least. Um, but she, yeah, she's in that in that as well as these and i actually did see the forest and it was pretty good um it was definitely creepy it's worth a watch especially after listening to this episode but now i want to watch the sea of trees with matthew mcconaughey because well, yeah i love matthew mcconaughey matthew He's fucking mcconaughey delicious delicious all right dish. all right all right did all you right. did i tell you that i almost starred in a film with him last summer what? two summers ago no yes. not even jerking your How? chain here How we were going to be co-stars Meaning, I was gonna be be in the background and maybe a background not actor. <laughs> <laughs> I was booked to be a background actor in a film he was shooting in Birmingham, <sighs> but because of COVID and one of our cars broke down, and I couldn't, I just, I couldn't leave Daniel and Violet home alone without a car for like probably sixteen hours a day for like two or three days. It just was not safe, you know. So I had to fucking cancel it. <sighs> How do you? I, I'm gonna kids. Uh, kids ruin everything. Kids they fucking ruin do everything. Oh my god, I was so pissed. I was so trying to find a way to make it happen. What if you became Mrs. McConaughey and your <sighs> child just ruined it for you? I don't know. He's already uh, got a pretty smoking hot wife, though. I know, but you're smoking hot. You could just go right in, be a home wrecker. I mean, uh, we were going to be co-stars, like I said. You were like side by side. Yeah. Mm-hmm, so, exactly. Yep. Too bad. Thanks, Thank Violet. you, Violet. Let this go down in history as the time you <laughs> fucked up my future with Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. So that was um that was some media related story about the forest. And actually in 2017, famous YouTuber Logan Paul, who I have no idea who this dude is, but I've heard his name. Same with me. I don't know who it is, but I hear that name often. He's a YouTuber, I guess. Mm -hmm. People are going to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe they know. We're old. Guys, we're 35. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know who this is. But famous YouTuber Logan Paul visited Aoki Gahara with a group of friends. And while filming, he actually stumbled upon a deceased man who appeared to have died by suicide. He tastelessly included it in his YouTube of the forest and within one day, it had six million views. Ooh. So he, I, be, I think the person may have hanged themselves, hung mm-hmm. themselves. I never remember the past tense of that verb. But he, I think what he did, because I couldn't find the video, but I think he like showed the face, like very, like sort and of a gruesome and didn't censor it at all. Mm-hmm. Now, Johnny Paranormal, he, the only time he'll ever actually show you is if they're like, bones yeah he'll show you a sc- some skulls mm-hmm. um but he does not just out of respect he won't show somebody just hanging there you know which i respect i mean i want to see it <laughs> but i respect why you don't <laughs> i know that's oh it's it's like me with adventures with purpose this is the type of stuff i watch on youtube and i've talked about it before it's these men that go in the water and find like car crashes from like could be a few days to could be decades yeah. and so they pull people out of the water and they blur the 
you know, they blur the people and they're trying to be respectful. And I 100% respect them for mm-hmm. it. But at the same time, I'm like, I want to see that decomp. Yeah. I want to see what that person's body looks like coming out of the water after two decades. But I understand. Oh, yeah. For the family. Uh, yeah, I want to see that but, decomp too. I, but I know. I get it. I get it. That just comes that with people that were born with morbid fascinations like we were. Yeah. We don't mean any disrespect, but we just got to see it. So... That's why yeah, I was so I in love wanna. with Rotten.com when the internet first started. Mm-hmm. Like, I could see a lot of dead bodies on that website. Yeah, There were a lot of, like, like terror group murders that I would see on that. Like, I'd see mm-hmm. people beheaded and shit like that. And I was, like, 11. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, body farms, hire us. Yeah, we're into it. <laughs> we were looking for these jobs. We're into it. Um, we're not a scientist. We'll just creepily poke them with sticks. We'll just, just poke them to see if they burst and, and fall apart in any places. Yeah. Um, but I would. I would want all the information, too. Like, how long have they been there? And like, oh, this is what that looks yeah. like at that time frame. Hire me. Hire me. Hire us. I got a porn star's butthole. <laughs> Hire me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please... <laughs> Go back and listen to our off the rails episode. It was a V three that we did live. V three. Go go yep. watch that. I'll go talk- listen to it. Because <laughs> otherwise, you're going to be like my beautiful asshole. Yeah, people are going to think I'm talking about. I'm telling telling everybody I have a porn star butthole. I do not have mm-hmm. that information. I regret to inform everybody. <laughs> Me, I have been informed <laughs> that about 15 years ago. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we all have that information. Porn star yes. asshole. <laughs> yep. All right. Logan Paul. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, he posted this shitty video, basically, and it got six million views in like one day. And he actually ended up being sued by a production company that claimed that the fallout from his video caused the company to lose a multi million deal with like a licensing agreement with Google. And Paul faced swift backlash, including losing the ability to make money on his YouTube videos through advertisements. Um, Yeah, which is like a punishment on the platform known as demonetization, according to the lawsuit. So he also was removed from the Google Preferred, which is some partnership with creators for Google advertisements. That's that's why they're influencers. It's because Mm -hmm. of shit like this. Um, But yeah, bitch got sued. He ended up putting out this like Dang. apology video and he was like, I wasn't thinking. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if it damaged his career or not because I don't know who the fuck he is. Sounds intense. <laughs> Towns, sounds a little intense. It does. It does. Yeah. Um, there are plenty of theories, but let's just go ahead and throw out the fact that there's just fucking ghost hunters. There's just people like us that mm-hmm. want to see that shit and we want to look for the fucking oh, yeah. spirits that are lost in the forest and and make them cross over <laughs> you know so many people go there just Absolutely. for that reason too so all these combined sort of is the idea of how this place got such a reputation it wasn't just one thing it was just a collective yeah. so it's amazing Yeah. So despite its sordid past, the local government actually has done quite a good job at reducing the number of deaths per year. Um, While still a lot and more than usual, they've, you know, they've reduced it. And that's what matters. Um, They ended up installing cameras at the entrance. And they posted those signs that we spoke about earlier, just sort of warning people like Mm -hmm. you're loved. Da da da. Don't do it. I think one even says, like, you're giving somebody else a job to clean up <laughs> something like think of the person that has to clean up yeah after yourself oh. you know what i mean so they also keep the trails really well manicured uh, but again if you go off the path that's your prerogative and you're probably going to get lost and it's going to get spooky <laughs> so but like i said like they do they put the cameras out they put the signs out everything's manicured like it's it almost feels like you're walking into a state park at first you know it's like you're not going to get lost Unless you get yourself lost on purpose, which is very easy. Yep. If you're going down the past, you're probably not going to run by a dead body. <laughs> like, it's a beautiful place to go. Exactly. Um, every now and then it's happened where people have, like, driven up and somebody went ahead and just killed themselves on in the trees, like, right on the side of the road. I was like, okay, cool, bro. Did you even try? Yeah, I didn't even try. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I guess I'm here. <laughs> 
Yeah. Maybe they're trying to be nice for the cleanup people. They're like, well, you don't have to go deep in. <laughs> I'm right here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's up yeah. with that. But so, yeah, they just stay on the path. You'll be good. Um, they've also increased a lot of the patrols. So they'll actually hire people that'll patrol regularly. I think even daily. I don't quote me on that, but I think they've got somebody that goes through daily. And like if they see people that look a little in distress or contemplative, they'll like they've been taught to sort of gently approach people and like sort of try to talk to them and almost be like counselor, like patrol counselors, essentially. Um, and I think cool. that's been a pretty big help in reducing those numbers every year, too. But obviously, this doesn't deter everyone and patrols do still have to conduct those searches to recover their mains fairly regularly. But again, the forest is so dense that the volunteers who search the area for bodies and those considering a suicide typically will do the thing where they mark their way by tying like plastic ribbons or tape around the trees. And this method basically prevents searchers from losing their bearings and leaving the paths. And, you know, they got they got to find their way back. <laughs> they, can't get, yeah. they can't get fucking lost. Um, but there is there is one thing about the forest soil so the soil is actually rich in magnetic iron, which can disrupt cell phone service and GPS systems and even compasses. So if you got lost, you might not be able to report the emergency. Um, so the tape and the ribbon sort of like a surefire way because your electronics just might be fucked. Um, so this yeah, would not be so help. Do that if you're going in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but on that note, also, people have just in just in the spirit of debunking shit. There's been a lot of people that have used that in like their ghost stories or like my meh, my compass stopped working and like oh, we didn't get any service or shit like that. And so it's like, well, oh. there's well, some soil science. issues. Well, yeah, there's some yeah. science here that's going <laughs> to. But sure, you can think that if it's cool for your story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so police and volunteers trek through the sea of trees to bring bodies out of the forest for a proper burial. And in the early 2000s, 70 to 100 people's remains were uncovered each year. So obviously it's got a reputation. 80% of people that go there are going for some spooky shit. I could probably guarantee that. It's not fact, so don't quote oh, me yeah, on it. Why, but 20%. That's go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 20% are not. They don't care. You know, they're just going to hike. So um, the local residents don't actually love the dark reputation that the forest has acquired and actually believe a stigma is attached to the name Suicide Forest, which, is, you know, obviously not the name of the forest. And a lot of them actually wish that they would close it off to the public completely. Um, but they also feel that, like, if you close it, it's going to make it even more tempting. So they're like, oh, yeah. You know, what are, what are go you going to do? More. But they definitely feel protected over it as they think it's like a sacred space. So they really basically hate everybody that's going there to do their YouTube videos and shit like that as much. I don't I guess I don't blame him for that. But we love Johnny Paranormal because he goes in to help. He's going in to help. He's documenting his help. And I totally would want to go. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I would be one of those assholes. So I'm sorry. We I am a, such a big fan of this guy. And I only just recently found him. But like I want to have him on an episode and like interview him because like this isn't all he does. He's also just like I think a general paranormal researcher. But like he's got some fucking stories. I bet it would be really cool to talk to him. For sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to basically finish this story by reading a quote by a guy named Josh Meyer, who wrote a blog post titled Beyond Death and Pain, The Truth About Japan's Suicide Forest. Um, and this is where he sort of denounced the sensationalism around the forest. And overall, I just think it's a really good, like a beautiful excerpt and a good note to end on because I think the same. It's still, you know, it's still a beautiful forest. It should be respected. We don't want it to get trampled over and ruined and littered and, no. you know. So he says, it's a compelling myth, the suicide forest, but myths can be rewritten. To deny Aoki Gahara's tragic history would be disrespectful to the lives lost there. However, letting it inhabit the same dark corner of the human imagination would imbue it with the wrong kind of power. Nevertheless, the forest also holds ethereal beauty begging to be separated from the stigma as a place where people go to die. Which is perfect. I don't know. That's really beautiful. I, th I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. 
It is kind of a sacred place. I mean, people decided to end their lives there. So it is sacred. Yep. You have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But to just be known for that and kind of think of it dark, you know, just like we do. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Yep. Sometimes you got to remind yourself, you know, of shit like that. So I wanted to try to I wanted to give the forest its its due respect um, while also, you know, letting people know why it's there, why it's so popular, why it's been sensationalized. It's been in movies, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. What an awesome place that you found. Thank you. Very odd, weird place. You know, I found a really cool story on Reddit from mm -hmm. a woman who used to work in the forest who found mm -hmm. a letter in a stream. And let me just tell you, the shit is fucking bananas. So this mm -hmm. her letter goes a little bit more into like the paranormal side of things. Mm -hmm. And she was basically like, this made me like completely rethink my entire experience working there and my beliefs and all sorts of shit like that. I, I can't read it because I don't have permission, but I have asked permission. So if if they read my message, yes, please. I will bring it to you guys in a show us your booze episode because you have to fucking hear it. It was like, yeah, my job was on the floor. Um, But yeah, so that. That is the Aokigahara, the Sea of Trees, the Suicide Forest. And I also want to remind everybody, because like us, I'm sure most of you have been touched by somebody who has lost their life to suicide at some point, that you can dial 988 for help from the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. And there's actually an entire list of international crisis hotlines at opencounseling.com. And then you hit the therapy and then click on the international hotline. So if you're one of our listeners that are not in the United States, that's where you can find some help. And we love or you. Or you can even DM us. You can message us. You can totally DM us. We're here too. We're here. We're here. You guys are our friends. Even though we don't know you, you know us. We tell you everything. Yes. So feel free. And, Talk to us. Yeah, yeah. We understand it. Mm -hmm. We understand it very much so and again we are pretty yeah. active on our socials so we see you guys and we especially see our repeat folks that come and interact mm -hmm. and we i feel like we get to know them and they send us funny links sometimes and comment and tag us and things and it's just i don't know i really like this little tiny community we've started and i just hope it gets bigger because everybody deserves a little weird right right we love you weirdos yeah, <laughs> me too well thank you for that you're welcome. I can't wait to hear what odd place you have brought me, even though I know what you're I know what you're doing, but I can't wait to hear all of it. See, it's one that I grew up with because this was one that my mom my mother was actually obsessed with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> obsessed with it. And now I know why going through it, yep. why boomers love it. My mom probably would have been considered a boomer. Um and why we don't hear about it as much anymore. Yep. So today we are going to talk about the Bermuda Triangle, or you might know it as the Devil's Triangle. What, what, what? Ooh, ooh, ooh. She's throwing up a triangle. Looks like she's trying to do Wu-Tang, though. Wu -Tang. <laughs> this is the BT sign. Yeah. BT, Bermuda Triangle. BT. BT. So the Bermuda Triangle, if you don't know, it's a mythical section of the Atlantic Ocean, and it's like a triangle that goes from Miami to Bermuda to Puerto Rico and it covers about 500,000 miles it's so massive. it's massive yeah and some people believe it's up to like a million miles too but it's mythical it's actually a mythical place the government doesn't even acknowledge <laughs> calling it the Bermuda Triangle but that is so where they it just is. I mean obviously it's not it's not fully mythical because it is a an existing body of water but they just don't recognize it as a mystical place yeah, they don't recognize yeah. it. It wasn't even recognized until the 60s, which we'll go into. But it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. So these busy water also happen to be the deepest waters in the Atlantic and are home to the Puerto Rico Trench, which is about 5.3 miles down and 8.6 kilometers deep. So it's fucking big. What's a kilometer? I don't know. I don't remember. Because I'm American. <laughs> That's why I put both. <laughs> oh, metric system. <laughs> In America, we're weird. We make our own. We make up our own shit. Make That's our own rules. Do, do what yep. we want. 
<laughs> Don't know what a kilometer is. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but a, a kilometer, 8.6 kilometers is 5.3 miles. We know that. <laughs> That's pretty big. It's pretty big. Pretty big. So uh, the Bermuda Triangle sits in a location which passes the Gulf Stream current and nearly every Atlantic storm. So the storms such as hurricanes and tornadoes, like over water, all mm-hmm. happens right in that spot. That's yeah. why places in the Gulf they always deal with the hurricanes. But that's yep. why it's kind of a kind of a, a be- not the best place to be around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even, I'm terrified yeah. of hurricanes personally. <laughs> like, really? like even more than tornadoes. Terrifies. Yes. 100% because really? I'm so terrified of water. Mm-hmm. And s- tsunamis are the worst. Tsunamis are up here. Tsunamis are pretty fucking terrifying. Oh, my gosh. The most terrifying. Like, that's – and I'm scared of what's under me, underwater. Yeah. So this this is, like, my hell. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hell. So we were talking a little bit about this. The Bermuda Triangle did not become a term until 1964. It was actually written in an article of a guy that just, like, started looking at all these, you know, shipwrecks and planes and stuff going down in this one area and going, what's going on? So he did an article and came up with the name Bermuda Triangle 1964. Ah, oh, just one guy. Yeah. One dude. He's one looking dude at the facts. Article. He's like, this yep. is a triangle. <laughs> yeah. And he wrote a book that year. So 1964 and 20 million copies were sold, which is why it was such a big thing back then, which is why we know it today. One dude, one Mm -hmm. dude created, created all this. Wow. I had no idea. I know. Me neither. That's why I said that's uh, not shocked that my my mom was a reader. She Mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't the best, but she was a reader. So it makes sense out of all things that she would be obsessed with this because that was kind of her time. Yeah. But even though of that, the reports of unexplained occurrences in the region date to the mid-19th century. And between 1946 and 1991 alone, there's been 70 disappearances. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. So some ships were discovered, like, completely abandoned for no apparent reason. Like, they didn't do distress signals. Even in this day of GPS, all of a sudden... Their boats have just disappeared. Makes mm-hmm. no sense. Yeah. Aircrafts have also reported and vanished. And rescue missions that have looked for those aircrafts have also vanished searching for them. So and if this you get is lost, when, you're fucked. You're fucked. Yeah. If you go in there and get lost, you're fucked. Yeah, it's completely unexplainable. Completely unexplainable. So the first recorded account of this area was actually by the du- biggest douchebag in history, Christopher Columbus. Oh, God. I know. Ugh. This fuck face. i bring old fucking Chris into this. <laughs> I have to. So when Christopher Columbus sailed through the area in his first voyage, which we now know as to America, he mm-hmm. reported a giant fireball come from the sky and crash into the sea in front of him. Mm. Well, that's wild. I know, right? Yeah. He also said there was like multiple lights, like he said, they, like energy looking mm-hmm. lights coming around him, and his compass was going in circles, which is why he thought he was going to India, Yeah, but he ended up in America. It was all, mm-hmm. like, just magnetic fuckery. Yeah. And that is what he experienced. The right Indians. <laughs> know, right? India. <laughs> yeah. Put another shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. That's why we're called Indians here. That is why don't we're call us Indians. Indians in America, but yeah, no, only Indians can call themselves Indians. So yep. That's the fact. <laughs> Facts. Yep. Right here. Mm-hmm. So, according to legend, one of the first ships that they found was in 1881. It was a ship called the Ellen Austin, and she was sailing from Liverpool to United States when it encountered an abandoned vessel. Now, opting to salvage the ship and its cargo, the captain sent over like men to the other ship to like take control of it to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. But during the nights, these ships were separated, and by the morning, the captain found the vessel completely abandoned with no trace of his men either. Damn. And that is just one of the first stories. And there's so many with over 70, but I did the ones... I I was looking through all these cases and trying to find ones that were really unexplainable, and I came up with what I thought were like the top few. Okay. So let's start. So in 1812, there was a ship called the Patriot. 
Now, I'm probably going to say this name completely wrong. So Theodosia Burr Alston was the daughter of Aaron Burr, who is the third vice president of the United States. Aaron Burr. And she was also the wife of a former governor of South Carolina. Now, she went on board the Patriot, which was a ship in 1812 that sailed from South Carolina to New York. The ship never arrived, and none of the passengers or the crew were ever found. And this was like a big deal because she was a very famous woman to her country. Mm-hmm. Yep. The next one I found was in 1918, which is a USS Cyclops, which I think the Cyclops is such a cool name for a ship. It is. And as you guys know, I'm obsessed with ships, and I feel this name. Cyclops. That is pretty badass. Right? The Cyclops. It's really badass. And I, I don't know if it was named this because it was so huge. Because this was actually a cargo ship that was 540 feet long and 65 feet wide. So it was very big for 1918. Yeah, it's a tank. Now, it's a huge. So when the United States declared war on Germany and its allies in April of 1917, this ship ended up falling in the command of the Navy. So it became a Navy ship. So in March of 1918, the ship went out with a crew of 306 men and disappeared without a trace. Now, how can you just get rid of a ship that large with 306 men? No distress signal, no radio calls at all. The Navy actually has this down as the deadliest unsolved mystery in the Navy and still remains the single largest loss of life in history in the United States Navy, not directly involving combat. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Like, that's insane. It is. Like, makes no sense because they had radios. If something was happening, they would have called. Yeah. Um. The first flight, which is actually the most popular fl- flight, which a lot of people talk to, is in 1945, and this was Flight 19. Now, in 1945, five U.S. Navy torpedo bombers went out for, like, a routine mission. So there were huge tanks, like mm-hmm. some of the strongest planes that we had at the time. Now, the mission seemed to be going smoothly until the leader of the mission, a Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, reported that his compass and backup compass just mm-hmm. completely malfunctioned. There's no magnetic soil, magnetic volcanic soil. (laughs) We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So the planes became disoriented, and then all of a sudden the radio completely stopped in them. Only hours after the disappearance, a rescue Mariner aircraft went out to search for it. Like, what the heck's going on? How do five of our airplanes just lose radio? It was a 13-man rescue, and they disappeared also within 30 minutes of the rescue mission. Wow. Yep. See you later. So, yeah, the Navy put out a statement saying we cannot even put a good guess out about what happened. Yeah. They're just like, we don't know. <laughs> Five planes. Now, this is badass. So I love a good solved mystery after like decades. Mm-hmm. So this is 45 years later in 1991. A videotape taken by a submersal cameras. I probably totally said that wrong. So a camera that goes under and just checks the bottom of the sea. Mm-hmm. Checked a depth of 600 feet and found five planes completely upright standing, laying in formation. Like in a row from each other. Weird. Right? Yeah. The cockpits of four of the planes were open and empty. All the Grunman torpedo bombers are apparently in good condition. The windshields and everything were completely intact. Weird. No human remains were found. Now, the crew that found the aircrafts were searching actually for a shipwreck when they came across this mysterious planes. One of the discoverers said, we have seen some pretty strange sights on the ocean floor, but it was with amazement and disbelief that we saw. The most logical explanation for finding five aircrafts was that they were pushed off the back of a carrier. But some of the propellers are actually bent backwards, an indication that they were spinning when they hit the water. But yet they are not stripped apart and are all staying up upright. Yeah. How cool is It's so weird. Yeah. Like I said, it's almost like they'd have to be placed there, but they weren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only thing I can think of is if it was just like so many years of natural ocean movement and like waves just like, you know what I mean? But putting them in a row like that? I don't know. I guess I think of the ocean floor, how it looks like. Yeah. Ripples in a row. Mm-hmm. But I have no signs to back that up. That's just what my brain thinks of. Yeah. 
That is it makes wild. no sense. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense. Um, one of the strangest disappearances was actually in the Bermuda Triangle happened in 1969 when two keepers of the Great Isaac Lighthouse in the Bermudas just suddenly vanished without a trace. So just two men watching this completely vanished makes no sense. Yeah. So let's start going to nowadays because we don't hear about the Bermuda Triangle nowadays. We hear about we hear about the flight. That's a big one. But we're going to start in the 90s and work our way up. So in 1991, there was a pilot flying a Grumman Kruger jet had just spoken to the control at Sauer that he was ascending in 20 minutes when his plane vanished. So he called the place. I'm going to be there in 20 minutes. Be there in 20. And all of a sudden he was gone. There's no blips, no debris, no wreckage, nothing. And they start searching for him, like, within an hour. Yeah. Just just completely out of thin air. Nothing. Um, another disappearance was in 1999. It was a 465-ton cargo ship freighter called Genesis that was sailing out the port of Spain. In an instance, a nearby sailing vessel picked up the radio's call for help. Whatever happened after the help, though, they didn't know. It completely disappeared without a trace. Another 465-ton cargo ship. Wow. Another one was a 16-foot fishing vessel. Now, this was in 2003. This was Frank and Ramona Leon. They had bought a 16-foot fishing vessel, and on Wednesday, June 18, 2003, they decided just to go have a day of fun. The weather was perfect. They were excited to take their new boat out. But all of a sudden, vanished. It was early Friday morning when the Coast Guard launched a rescue mission. They searched... 35,700 square miles and found no wreckage and no sign that the boat even existed. Damn. So by this time, it wasn't back in the day, the radios back in the day, but just like um, cars almost, they have GPSs in them. Yeah. Boats legally have GPSs in them now. You should be able to find those just like airplanes do. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense that all of a sudden they wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Makes no sense. Um, 2008, a Dominican Republic flight. It was actually a plane carrying 11 passengers set out for the Dominican Republic Republic to the Bahamas. Now, reports claim that the flight took off from the Dominican airport and was ascending in 35 minutes when it disappeared off radar. Just boom. Which I'm surprised I haven't heard of that one yeah. because I love like the Malaysia flight and stuff. Like I love following and trying to solve these weird cases like this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's one I did not hear of. Huh. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that one either. No. A couple more. Uh, 2015, there was two teenage boys named Offen Stepanos and Perry Cohen, both 14 years old, went out for a fun fishing trip by themselves in the Bahamas. Just before the disappearance, a teen posted a two-word Snapchat that they were in trouble. If you're in trouble, don't Snapchat. Yeah, (laughs) no comment. What? Wait, how old are these kids? 14? 14. And they're going on their own fishing expedition? Yeah, going out in the Bahamas. That feels... Did they live there? <laughs> it just feels like in no... in in Not in any world would I tell Violet at 14, yeah, you can go on a fishing expedition out on the ocean by yourself. Well, I was driving a car illegally at that time. So we've come from different families. So I guess I'm like, yeah. I was too. <laughs> I was stealing my mom's car at 14. See? But... You got to think of what type of 14-year-old is it? There's 14-year-olds out here getting married on these streets. (laughs) Yeah, that's a whole other topic. (laughs) I know. All right. But what I'm saying is it depends on the life, Depends on the life. And and if you come from a fishing family... Yeah. Yeah. I guess I just need more details of these two. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) proceed. They have their fishing trip. They send a Snapchat. They're like, in trouble. <laughs> you know. Bruh, we're in trouble. <laughs> Bro, in trouble. So this caused the largest U.S. Coast Guard search in history to this day, and they span 15,000 square nautical miles. Fuck. Now, their capsized 19-foot fishing boat was found eight months later, over 100 miles off the coast of Muta Coast. The investigators discovered the boat's battery was at intentionally turned off what yeah like it was just turned off that's weird 
It is very strange. There is actually a possible sighting of one of the boys two days after their disappearance by a pilot, Bobby Smith, and his granddaughter. The pair spotted someone lying on their back on what appeared to be floating debris. The person waved their arms when the pilot circled around, but Smith called the ghost card and quickly lost sight of the person. Oh. Sadly, the boy was never found. Oh, no. So he could have survived. Oh, fuck. That would suck. Ew. That would be hard to forgive yourself. <laughs> right? Even though you tried, you know, I'd be like, ugh. I know. <laughs> Little 14-year-old boy. Oh, my goodness. Um, in 2017, someone else that was also very popular on a private plane um, May 2017, Skylight Group founder and CEO Jennifer Blumen, her three and four year old sons, and her boyfriend pilot Nathan Ulrich vanish. Now, Blumen was traveling with her children from Puerto Rico to Titusville, Florida, in her private plane. The plane was about 24,000 feet up when it disappeared from radar completely. The following day, the U.S. Coast Guard discovered a debris field of a missing plane 15 miles east of Uretha. No one on board was ever found and no cause of crash was ever determined. That's weird. Yeah. All these I'm going to say that's weird. It's all it all sounds <laughs> red flag, red flag. Very red flag. electronic, right? Mm -hmm. Um the latest one was actually in 2020 called the Mako Cuddy cabin vessel. Probably said that wrong. <laughs> this is actually a ship of 20 passengers that left Bimini on December 28th, bound for Lake Worth Beach, Florida. The weather was good. Everything was actually great outside. There was no communication or distress signal. Everything was great. All of a sudden, they didn't show up. 20 people vanished. The U.S. Coast Guard searched 17,000 miles over 84 hours calling off the search. No wreckage, debris, or remains were ever found. So why... Wow. It's weird. So why is it's weird? This? Like, why is this <laughs> happening? So a lot of it, obviously, magnetic mm -hmm. anomalies and navigational challenges. So you were talking about how that forest, how all of a sudden, like compasses and phones mm -hmm. and everything like that can happen. Yep. But this is something I didn't know. I actually started researching this. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So the Earth's magnetic North Pole isn't the same as the geographical North Pole, which means the compass usually, you know, they point north. You know, they're going towards the north and going towards the south. But when mm -hmm. you're in this area, it's called an agnotic line. Have you ever heard of that word? It's an imaginary line on the Earth's uh -uh. surface connecting the north and south magnetic poles. So it's kind of just showing like, you know, from the mm -hmm. top of the Earth to the bottom. It's a pole that we created, but it's actually what our compasses yeah. go by. Okay. I'm sure I was taught this in school and have no recollection. <laughs> Absolutely. I didn't either. Like every time I was reading on this, I was like searching. What does this word mean? What does this word mean? Yeah, I think I was just high in geography class. <laughs> right. <laughs> so a theory is that the Bermuda Triangle might be home to like a large scale magnetic anomaly that's like kind of right between that area. So it warps mm -hmm. compasses. Yeah. And electronics. Mm -hmm. And actually, that line runs from Lake Superior down to the Gulf near the Bermuda Triangle. So I told Mark, I'm like, I really badly want to find this part in Lake Superior and bring a compass and see if it fucks up. Yeah. Why not? Like, people, like, look if you live on this line. I'd be very interested. Yeah. Because I've always wondered how compasses work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. It is amazing. But I Science. guess it's just science dudes and i i, I, I don't know that. it's just it's really neat um another one is undersea methane deposits now the seafloor in the region is known to contain large pockets of gas that could be released suddenly turning the ocean in the area into a frothy soup that swallows ships yummy nummy but yet there's no evidence of any recent methane release around the area and it shows according to ge geologists that that hasn't happened in fifteen thousand years Oh, so well, is rah, it the math Who knows? Maybe so. Are there a bunch of whirlpools sucking them down? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that is one inconsistent ocean. Now, besides this frothy soup of hell, the hurricanes there, the random ocean tornadoes, there's mm -hmm. actually at the bottom of the Bahamas, there's like scary discoveries. At the bottom, there's like these big black holes, and it's only in this area that they create gigantic whirlpools. They sink hundreds of thousands of gallons of water at a time, and you can't escape them. Fuck. So it's like these huge tunnels underneath the Bahamas where ocean water is going in and out like 20,000 gallons at a time. Yeah, that's terrifying. It's absolutely, again, my hell. 
yeah. <laughs> my hell. Yeah. Um, only about 20% of these large holes have ever been explored. Um, they believe that there's tunnels so that these ships, it could possibly go under. And then what mm-hmm. happens instead of laying at the bottom of the ocean floor, they're under the mud. Pretty much. Oh, yeah. Through these mm-hmm. tunnels. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, The people on the islands actually have a belief or myth of a giant octopus creature that lives in those holds named Luska that drags the vessels underneath. Ooh, I like that one. Right? Kraken. Mm -hmm. Luska. Yep. Luska. Love it. Rogue waves. Um, a rogue wave is usually, um, you know, just large. It's kind of like a tsunami, but it's it's not as big. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, scientists at the University of Southampton in England claimed that the waters of the Muna Triangle were ripe for rogue waves due to storms moving in from all sides, and that these waves could reach a hundred feet in height. Ooh, that's scary too. Scary, but that wouldn't explain the airplanes. That would explain possibly mm-hmm. some ships, but also. I don't think it would do the ships either because you would see debris. Some of these people are getting um, having rescue missions within 30 minutes and nothing is there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the mm-hmm. scientific. Now I'm going to go into less scientific. We're going to talk about Atlantis and aliens because this yeah. is, I don't know, but like I'm usually not a conspiracy theorist, but I kind of am when it comes to there being a triangle. I w- yeah, I want to be. Like I, That's where I want to be. Yeah. I want to be in that place. That's where you. <laughs> Me too, because I like listen to all these like messing girls <laughs> holes under the water. I'm like, fuck that, it's aliens. <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> this is fair. <fact."> Mermaids, <laughs> <laughs> right? Mermaids. <laughs> so, Atlantis actually came from a Greek myth written by Plato. But I want everyone to remember here when we talk about Greek mythology, this used to be facts. To them back to them, in the day. Yeah. Just like, it was like their religion. Just like Christians take their Bible as fact, Muslims take their Bibles as fact. Like Greek myths, like written by Plato, like this was fact back in the day. Mm-hmm. So Atlantis was described as a naval empire that ruled all the Western parts of the known world. It was a utopia boasting an advanced civilization rich in wisdom and wealth. So it was way ahead of its time. And people who believe in Atlantis believe it's even ahead of our time that we are now. They don't really say there's so many reasons of why they believe this happened, but Atlantis is now believed to be underneath the ocean. They don't know if it's because it was thousands of years ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, it just went under. Yeah. Or if it was their civilization that went under. Well, it just, you, whatever you think it is. Whatever you think. Whatever you think it is. So some suggest that Atlantis's destruction resulted from a technological catastrophe, such as like a nuclear explosion or like advanced energy sources fucking them all up. Mm -hmm. So there's a theory that the inhabitants of Atlantis were either themselves extraterrestrials or at least had contact with alien beings. Now, this myth is often rooted due to Plato talking about how they had these, you know, technology technological advancements just like we see now with like the pyramids and stuff like how did people build this back in the day yeah yeah like i can't wrap my brain around how that would be possible without modern technology yeah and even my like even now modern technology with some of the stuff i don't think would be how it is especially with what they had so a lot of people believe it was extraterrestrials just like you know there's writings that show there were extraterrestrials which we've talked about in past lives but plato believed that atlantis was either extraterrestrials or they were for sure being helped by it now this might all seem crazy and everything like that but it actually really isn't and this is why Multiple mysterious structures have been reported under the ocean in the Bermuda Triangle. Some look like man-made structures and even pyramids. These structures are called the Mimini Road. Fact. Boom. Boom. <laughs> scientists. <laughs> Nerd alert. Fucking scientists. Nerds. 
nerd alert. In the 1960s, a map was actually created showing multiple shipwrecks in the area, mm-hmm. including their coordinates. So they started mapping it. It was believed that this map was created when satellites went up and they could actually start seeing into the ocean through that, which is pretty crazy they can. Yeah. So explorer Daryl Milkos at the time was starting to keep secret maps and started to give it to his close friend, who was a famed NASA astronaut, Gordon Cooper. Ooh, Coops. Yeah, Mr. Coop, NASA Coop. On one of these maps showed a large area that they could tell was a vessel, but they couldn't tell what type of vessel it was. So they decided to go underneath. So in 2018, treasure hunters went to figure out what it was, and they had to go 300 feet to find three identical vessels laying next to each other covered in coral. They're all unexplainable. Like, they they have no idea what these are. There's pictures of them. I'll show you. They are not a ship. They are not an airplane. They're in perfect condition. Um, they, they're they not what look like a regular UFO. Yeah. But who knows what it is? Um, They call it a USO, an unidentified submerged object. Submerged. Oh, USO. Yes. Cute. Uh, and they are believed to provide the first evidence of an extraterrestrial visit to Earth hundreds of years ago. Because they be old. And the only reason they know they're old is because of the plant life growing around them. Mm -hmm. But they're still way more advanced than the shit we have. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. And That's wild. It's wild. That's wild. So so Daryl states, the identical formations in three different areas, because there's three of them perfectly lined up, Mm -hmm. don't look nature made. They don't look man made. Certainly nothing I've ever seen based on my experience. And I have years of experience doing this. We've identified multiple different types of shipwreck material. This doesn't match or look like any material we have. Hmm. The person who made these maps. Now, I want to talk about this person because he's not a kook. Like, this is fact. I am not a crook. Sorry. (laughs) So during his post-NASA career, the former U.S. Air Force Cooper became well-known and an outspoken believer in UFOs and claimed that the U.S. government was covering up its knowledge of extraterrestrial activity, which we know they did. Yeah. They admit it now. Yeah. But... He was a whistleblower then, Mm -hmm. and he's the one that created these maps. So he states, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews were visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are on Earth. And he said this to United Nations Council in 1985. He said, I feel that we need to have a top level coordinated program to scientifically collect and analyze data from all over the earth concerning any type of encounter and to determine how best to interface with these visitors in a friendly fashion for many years i have lived with a secret in a secrecy imposed on all specialists and astronauts i can now reveal that every day in the u.s our radar instruments capture objects of form and composition unknown to us Mm-hmm. damn boy i know right mm-hmm. i love him i love him so miklo said cooper often told him stories of ufo sightings and believed a lot of the world's technical advances were passed down to governments from alien planets and that's what they believe were those old ships under the water mm-hmm. so god pretty Coops, i love a good whistleblower me too mm-hmm. And I don't know if there's an Atlantis, but there's something fucking under the water there. Some mysterious shit. The ocean and we've, is fucking creepy as fuck. Let's I hate be it. honest. It I hate it. It's been, how much of it it's, it has been like, there's like 80% of it is unexplored or some ridiculous number. Yeah. It's, it's terrifying. It's insane. I hate it. I hate everything under my feet. Uh, <laughs> terrifying terrifying but i want to live by it i love i love seeing it and touching it lightly and then being like okay, <laughs> okay bye <laughs> don't need to go on a that dolphin nice. cruise <laughs> no don't need to see too yeah. much i trust you're cool yeah. uh bruce gernan actually says um he's a pilot and discuss unexplained encounters in the muna triangle involving phenomena called electronic fog and he believed it was actually interdimensional portals oh, yeah Okay. That he was going into. He deals his own flight experience that he was going through this fog in a storm over the Andros Island. He said that the fog looked like snow on a TV that lost his reception and surrounded the aircraft so he couldn't fly through it. He recalled when he finally broke free, free he ended up getting like going through long lines. Lines. 
like these long electronic lines okay. like he saw he was flying through. Okay. Like, how weird is that? Yeah. It's so weird. That's my favorite theory. Right? Mm-hmm. I love it, too. I love it, too. Now, some people, I actually like this theory, too, because, you know, I love when an ancestor comes back and fucks shit up. Mm-hmm. So some believe African slaves haunt the seas in the Bermuda Triangle, and that is what is going on. So the leading person of this theory is called a Kenneth McGall, who is actually a psychiatrist who practiced for over four decades. So it is not known how many slaves were taken to the North and Central America, as well as the Caribbean, but some estimated the number beyond 2 million. Damn. Now, a lot. Yeah, historian and cultural critic Henry Louis Gates also writes between 1525 to 1866 in the entire history of the slave trade in that area, there is 12.5 million Africans shipped to the New World. 10.7 10.7 million survived. That means over 2 million were put in those seas. Wow. She haunted. So it would make sense why there would be some shit there. Mm-hmm. So he theorizes that the loss of ships and airplanes as well as people is a consequence of a curse put on by the area by African slaves. Now, McAll also acknowledged that while some slaves died and were thrown overboard, some of the British sea captains even threw living slaves overboard there to defraud insurance companies. Well, that's fucked up. Doesn't surprise me, but that's fucked up. Absolutely. We have a really terrible history in the U.S. and in that area because that was kind of the first... Yeah. I don't like to say it's found area, but the first mm-hmm. area they're bringing in, it was down there and it was in New York. Yeah. So yeah. that would make sense. Mm-hmm. So fuck those ships. Fuck those ships. <laughs> you feel like you got to take them down, take them down, guys. Fuck these I ships in particular. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to get into another favorite, psychic insights and unsolved mysteries. Ooh, you know, I love it. So what are the psychics saying about this? So according to some psychics, the Muta Triangle harbors a powerful psychic connection to historical incidents and ancient shipwrecks that have left like an imprint on the surroundings. Now, we've talked about that a lot, how once you pass, you can leave an imprint. And a lot of people say they believe it's like in dirt or water mm-hmm. or brick. So it would make sense with all mm-hmm. this history that there would be there. So psychic mediums propose that these traumatic events have imprinted their emotional imprints on the very fabric of the region. Some believe that the Bermuda Triangle acts like a giant vortex, but instead of wind, it harnesses electromagnetic anomalies. Which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So these unexplained disruptions in the Earth's magnetic field are said to create a swirling force that acts as a doorway between dimensions. So a lot of psychics are saying like this is that there's multiple areas. They say this isn't the only area, but this mm-hmm. is an area where you can go between dimensions. It's like a cosmic whirlpool. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I'm so, into it. Right? That's so what of course I think. She, I know. Me too, right? That's what mm-hmm. I want to think. So, of course, I had to check my channeling Eric to see if he had something <laughs> yeah. on it. Because if you guys don't know, channeling Eric is a YouTube channel where a group of mediums go together and channel a, cert- a certain... <laughs> Um, spirit that is past name Eric. I absolutely love it. I talk a lot about it. So I found is, um, according to Channeling Eric and a psychic Jamie Butler, who is my favorite, um, this area was created by people, aliens, and other star nations. That there is a huge vortex in the area and also other places on our ocean we have not yet to discover. He says that this area was above water and the people there were technology technology advanced um which makes sense just like we believe with atlantis they use it for positive but when the earth started to shift instead of the power pushing out it now draws in Mm -hmm. so like a black hole of electromagnetic frequencies that can change the structure of whatever material it is that's what it's doing so Mm -hmm. how he described it is like you take a spoon and you put it in there and the spoon warps yeah quite literally So that's the psychic aspect. I'm into it. it. Me too. I believe this. I don't care what anyone says. I will die on this. Die on this. (laughs) I'm on board. I'm on board this (laughs) ship. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) We're now we're talking about facts from the nerds, but I believe this is stuff. 
Gonna so the facts for the I'm gonna nerds. end end on these facts. So according to the U.S. Coast Guard and the NOAA, there is no evidence that ships or planes disappear more frequently in the Bermuda Triangle than they do anywhere else in the world. Lies. This is just a well-traveled place. I know. I'm like, you guys are hiding shit. Lies. And all the people I said were not stupid people. These were psychologists. These were NASA people. Like, these are all mm-hmm. smart people. So fuck you, U.S. Mm-hmm. Coast Guard. <laughs> yep. Not for U.S. Coast Guards, this podcast. Not for U.S. Coast Guards. <laughs> this podcast. Dear Girls Gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, like we said, the first mention of the Bermuda Triangle was in 1964 by Vincent Gaddis. He cataloged the many catastrophes. This guy knew it was up. He did an appalled magazine called Argosy. Um, Ten years later, the paranormal enthusiast Charles Belitz released the best-selling book talking about the Bermuda Triangle and kind of the, you know, mediums and everything behind it. So these are the two mm-hmm. people that really brought this forth, which is why, like I said, our baby baby boomer parents were really into it and kind of told the rest of our millennials all these stories. And that we don't hear about it now because scientists are trying to debunk it. But like yeah. I said, we're saying fuck you scientists on this story. Yep. Of fuck my you Bermuda nerds. Triangle. Every time I was yep. reading about it, because I haven't actually researched it, I was mm-hmm. I just know like my mom told me and like stories, you know, people told me. But yeah. then I started to research it and they were trying to debunk all the things I believed in it. And I was just like, mm-mm. Nah. Nah, bro. Not today. Nope. But that's the Bermuda Triangle. That's one the of the craziest triangle. places. And I believe craziest it's a vortex places. for aliens. <laughs> Likewise. Yes. <laughs> I think I think it's definitely a, a tear in the fabric of our reality, for sure. There's an something. Entrance. Yeah. There's yeah. literal unidentified spacecrafts. Or not spacecrafts. They could go underwater. Submerged. Submerged crafts underwater. USOs. There's five random planes perfectly lined up down there. Like, mm-mm. after that long. That one I keep thinking uh, ripple. That one I want to debunk as a ripple effect. But no. But I wouldn't. But I wouldn't be surprised that. to have somebody prove my wrong. And I hope they do. <laughs> I know. Well, there was that pilot that said he survived it and went through some weird shit. So it is true. Can Who we knows? get them on our podcast? Who knows? Can, can you make that happen? We should. <laughs> oh, I want that NASA guy. It's too bad he passed away. But I love the guy that's doing his work. Keep doing his work. Be a weirdo. I appreciate you weirdos that just keep going for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Be whistleblowers. We'll ask our uh, we'll ask our personal assistant to see if they can hook us up with That'd an interview cool. with these people. <laughs> yeah. We currently don't have a personal assistant, but we will someday. <laughs> Well, I'll I'll be our personal assistant and I'll do a little voice dance. <laughs> Whatever you guys want. I want the southern. She's I want really the nice. Southern voice back though. <laughs> I want a southern <laughs> one. <laughs> it was so good. Um, thank you. We I love the Bermuda Triangle. I'm glad you did that. But yes, it's a very that's just a small blip that you're getting the. It is huge. It is huge. Like I said, there's like seventy plus stories that you can read on this, but those were. My favorite, because it makes no sense. Yes. Yeah, that was a great like for beginners. Because I mean, who knows? Like you said, you don't really hear about it that often anymore. Like it's sort of slipped into like past knowledge, and you've filed it back in your brain. Like so, who knows if the youth of today have any idea what it is? You know, or how far that go? Like I'm yeah, sure my and- sister does, but. I don't know if it's because scientists are trying to debunk it and the government, but I don't like that the government's not even acknowledging it. See, that's why I think something's fishy as fuck. Just like they didn't acknowledge like Area 51 forever. Yeah. Like. Do you think it's just too big of a reveal? Like it's too big of a, it's like, it's like they want to ease us into it rather than just jamming it as us. It's very sexual references. (laughs) (laughs) i believe that we should just be known everything i don't believe the government we pay them 
No. We they pay them tax it out money. They should not be able to control. Leisure. I know. I yep. don't like it. But you know, now they're starting to, re- you know, to release documents in the C- CS, the CSI, <laughs> the <laughs> CIA <laughs> is releasing you know, documents where they're talking about like astral projection and remote viewing. And we're getting into sort of like interdimensional travel and stuff like that. And they're releasing that know, stuff like so little cool. by little. Mm-hmm. So like, maybe that's why they don't want to acknowledge Bermuda because it would be like, it'd be like, here it all is, you know, it's a fucking entrance, you know, they're trying to <laughs> ease it in with little documents here and there. <laughs> no, give me it all. I want all of it. We can handle it. What does he think? People are just going to go down there and go crazy. Start jumping in the ocean. People will go mad. Uh, they're going to think end of days. I Did you hear so. that about that woman? Mm-hmm. There was some, well, I don't know the exact story, so I hesitate telling it right now because I don't have my facts straight. But it was the it was the day of the eclipse and she had thought that, I don't know if it's because she didn't know there was an eclipse coming or if she just had some theories about it. But when the eclipse happened, I think she was in the path of totality. She like killed her kids and like killed herself i'm like she thought it was like the end of the world like it was just like oh holy gosh. shit woman like mm-hmm. calm your tits <laughs> well we have a whole government uh, that i believe is believing in the end of days as in according to the bible and are purposely trying mm-hmm. to bring the end of days according to the bible because yeah. they want to see the jesus and so that's what i think about our government right now so i yeah <laughs> just let it go you want it to be in a days in your, which I don't believe in, yeah. obviously, that. Um, but. Well, thank you again. Thank you again. That was lovely. Thank you. It was lovely. You're welcome. I have one that I am so excited to tell. I, it, I wanted to call everybody I know and just tell them the story. So now I get to, kind of. So everyone listen to fuck up. Yep. Listen to fuck up. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna ease you into this one too. I can't throw you in. I have to like you can't see you'd be perfect in the government. Yeah, I gotta ease you in. So I want you to imagine someone that's rich enough in the 1920s to build an entire prefabricated industrial town on 3,900 square miles of land in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Okay. Now imagine that that person is none other. Than Henry Ford, as in the Henry Ford, the American industrialist and the founder of the Ford Motor Company. What? Henry Ford. <laughs> yes. Weirdo. <laughs> yep. So we are going to talk about Fordlandia. Is it called Fordlandia? <laughs> yes. It's called oh my Fordlandia. Gosh. And I always keep wanting to call it Portlandia, but it's Fordlandia. Yeah. And it's in the middle of the it. Amazon. <laughs> I'd like to think the water tower's got like the Ford logo. <laughs> Ford Landia. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> yes, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Love it. That'd be some rich people shit I would do if oh I my became God. rich. Yeah. Absolutely. Hundred. In the nineteen twenties, the Ford Motor Company didn't want to fuck with the British monopoly over the supply of rubber, which as we know was used to make tires and like various other car parts. I don't know fuck about rubber, apparently, because up until I had heard of this story, I thought that rubber was a synthetic material. <laughs> um, what is it? It's fucking natural. It's a natural material. Is it? Where do you find it? Yes. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. I mean, I don't remember being taught this in school. Mm-hmm. Like, I actually ended up going up to my husband and I was like, did you know that rubber is a natural material (laughs) and he was like yeah and i'm like he did how yeah i was like how did you know how did you find when did did you find did you were you taught this in school Mm -hmm. like i don't remember are we just stupid fucks and everyone listening to us knows this because i feel like it for some reason i think like plastic i'm gonna take a poll i'm gonna take Mm -hmm. a poll because i need to know again if we're just idiots yeah so anyway you know who else didn't know fuck about rubber Hmm. henry ford (laughs) <laughs> well he knew more than me so I can, only, I can say that much but we'll get into the details of his poor knowledge of it in a little bit i'm gonna tell you what he did know he knew that if he was gonna like outsmart the british he was gonna have to come up with his own rubber 
you know, remember, they've got the monopoly over it. And he's just like, fuck this. I'm tired of giving them all my money for this rubber. Um, And what better way to do that than getting your own rubber trees, right? Rubber trees? Rubber trees. What? So this will help you imagine a little bit. So it's a little fun fact. Did you know that dandelion milk actually contains the same quality latex as natural rubber trees? No, oh you God. probably didn't because you didn't know what a rubber tree was. No. <laughs> Just like me. Oh, my gosh. But that's what that's it. You know, when you break up dandelion mm. and it's got that milky substance, yeah. it's it's like a latex, essentially. So this is what I'm going to tell you then. I wish this just happened. So we like to watch How It's Made. There's a show called How It's Made and it shows you yeah. how things are made. Mm-hmm. And we're watching how bubble gum, the first like bubble gum was made. And it's made out of rubber. Bubble gum is made out of rubber. And it's usually just like flavor with a corn syrup and has a coloring to it. And we were so fucking grossed out because we thought we're like, are you really like chewing on plastic? But it's rubber based. Yeah. And so now I'm a little less grossed out by it. Less grossed out because it's a natural. No. Maybe that's where it came from where people are like, don't swallow it. Like, because it's not that's, digestible. That's what I was yeah. talking to Mark. I was My husband, Mark, I was like, that's probably why you're usually putting plastic inside your body. Because again, I don't know rubber is made from trees. I'm yeah. thinking it's this man-made plasticky thing. Yeah. Interesting. No. All right. All right. Less gross. Did you know that? My husband swallows every single piece of gum that he chews. Really? Almost immediately as well. Like he can't chew gum for more than five or ten minutes before he has to swallow it. Why doesn't he just spit it out like a normal human I don't being? know. I've asked. Yeah. I think it's like he's just like, why? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like it tastes good. It's candy. It's it's, it's edible. I'm just going to swallow it. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, he's still alive. Yeah, he's there. So. So He's whoever here. told you not to swallow, it's a fucking liar. Fucking liar, because my husband's been doing it for yeah. 40 some years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so back to our rubber. <laughs> so with the dandelions, I was just going to say in the fun fact, too, that at actually uh, Nazi Germany conducted research projects trying to use dandelions as a base for rubber production, but they failed. Oh, I'm just a Nazi and I don't know what to do with dandelions. I don't know how to make rubber. I do not not how to make rubber. (laughs) 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 That was a good German accent we did, I think. I feel it. I feel it. it? (laughs) Anyway, okay, let's go back to old Henry. So he came up with a seemingly brilliant plan to establish his own colony to produce his own rubber for his own company. So negotiations between Ford Motor and the Brazilian government actually resulted in a signed agreement for Ford to receive an area of around two and a half million acres called Boa Vista. The agreements actually exempted Ford from taxes on the exportation of goods produced in Brazil in exchange for 9% of the profits total. Um, 7% was supposed to go to the Brazilian government and two to the local municipalities. Um, And it was initially estimated that when the plantation was under full cultivation, that it would produce enough rubber to make tires for two million cars a year. Oh, wow. And good for the government. Yeah. Good for the government. Good for you, Ford. Exactly. Yeah. They were getting those profits. They were going to make a ton of fucking rubber. Like, let's go. So in 1928, work on the town of Fordlandia began. Um, He initially invested $2 million in it, which is a lot of money for 1928. And that was just what they had to start. Yeah. So it was actually being developed as a community with a different area of the city being designated for the Brazilian workers and the American managers, which are like the higher ups kind of these managers. Um, And they lived in the quote unquote American village. So, again, this is a whole prefabricated town. I need to see pictures. You need to see. (laughs) So they had houses. They had a hospital. They had a school, a library, a hotel. Um, All these things were built along with like a swimming pool, a playground, and a golf course, which is, again. Badass. You're in the middle of the Amazon. Badass word. Yeah. You know, it's wild. But work on Fordlandia was actually flopping pretty quickly. It was really poorly planned. 
And because this is still like the fucking Amazon, there were diseases like malaria and yellow fever (laughs) that actually struck down quite a bit of their workers. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think he literally thought that you could just mow down like this property, plop it in there and like we're good to go. It's just like our talk about the Panama Canal and how I said how amazing it was that all these people came and created a city to rid this canal and they were just like didn't realize like the shit that's there. Yeah. <laughs> like the diseases and uh-huh. the stuff's not made to be cleanly yet. No. And like sewage and like. There's natives, yeah. there's tribes. Like. like... <laughs> can't just flop shit in the rainforest as cool as it sounds. So obviously this all this disease struck down a ton of workers. So he ended up needing more workers. So when he was looking for help, he opened some offices in nearby cities, hoping to bring some of the local talent, if you will, with the promise of good wages, free food, free shelter, free medical care, and access to all the leisurely amenities like the pool and the cinema and the shops and the restaurants. And, you know, Super there's cool. all that stuff too. Yeah. So like, sounds like a dream come true, right? Like, Come here. He's bringing in all this work. You might have malaria, yeah. but we have a sweet ass pool. <laughs> well, we a pool, you get food, you yeah. get a you get a free house, like, and you. Yeah, I'm sure he thought like these people are like, oh, I come from like a fucking hut, mm-hmm. so this is amazing. Like he's doing such a service, you know. <sighs> Wrong. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> The native workers actually did not love this Americanized way of living. They were used to their like palm thatched roofs, their regional mm-hmm. food and their way of life. And in Fordlandia, it it's like you plopped them into fucking Pleasantville. Did you see the movie Pleasantville? Yes. Yep. It's like you just took these native folks mm-hmm. that just need some jobs, plopped them in Pleasantville. It's like, all right, do as the locals do. <laughs> Well, as Americans, we just can't understand how everybody doesn't want to be just like us. Exactly. Like, we are weird like that. Like, we we think we are, not I, but we, like, as a country in America, where I was, we're number one. We're the best. Let me show and you how like, to live life. <laughs> like, yeah. This is the only way. Like, we're right. Yeah. yeah. And, like, people are happy, can be happy living their lives. And it could be a lot more fulfilling than the shit that we have. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so it makes no sense. And Henry Ford <laughs> was 100% one of those people. America. Fuck yeah. So, so, yeah. So, these natives are plopped in total, total 360. No, 180. <laughs> total 180 from where they were. <laughs> um, and they had to participate in things like poetry readings and square dancing (laughs) which is fucked up (laughs) they had there were i mean there were clothes that it's like it it, you can imagine it's very awkward super weird it's like come on henry stop while you're ahead like you're yeah this isn't okay so the natives so they get you know they're they're like oh you can have these free homes but their native homes were actually built high to like keep away animals and insects. And now they were put in these tiny shitty little American houses where like pests would get in and like, Mm -hmm. you know, they built their shit the way they need to, to for the area and the climate. And again, just another example for just like, let's just plop this here and it'll work just fine. They knew what was up. They're natives. Yeah. So they were also only given the option to eat a Midwestern style diet that was provided to them. And they had frequently complained of stomach troubles due to the unfamiliar diet. Um, Because oftentimes it was like the same thing over and over. Like, again, you think like, this is going to be awesome. Such an American. He's like, here's brown rice. Here's whole wheat bread. Here's canned peaches. And here's oatmeal. And they're like, "Um, yeah, what the fuck? I'd be pissed too. Like, yeah. Give me some of that pound de cajo, you know, the like Brazilian cheese bread. Give me some of that. I don't want your fucking oatmeal. Mm, Brazilian food is so good. Oh my God, it is. So good. It's so good. Um, So the food, the food was a huge thing. You know, it's like Bra- Brazilians love their food. Don't fuck with their fucking food. No. So no. they were so pissed 
about not only the food, but the way things sort of went down when it came to eating. So like there were restaurants and they were initially like when things first started out, they were like served like like there were waiters and they they were mm-hmm. served food. Um, and I think it, it was still the shitty food, but it was like they were served food. Like a restaurant. Yeah, yeah, but somewhere along the line, they stopped doing that and they had to do it like cafeteria, like buffet style, like in and out, like just picture like a school and it's just not inviting. Yeah. And they're like, that was it. They were like, we're fucking done with this. Like, we're not getting served the way we used to. Mm-hmm. The food fucking sucks. So they fucking revolted. Like they rioted in yeah. the town's cafeteria. The workers grabbed their fucking machetes and they destroyed the place. They cut the telegraph wires. They chased away the whiteies who waited in their boats for the riot to end. And they even (laughs) chased away the town cook into the jungle for a couple days while the Brazilian army arrived and, like, got things under control. Yes. I kind of love it. I know. I can just – I just am imagining, like, a cook with, like, the white outfit and the tall white hat just, like, running into the Amazon. (laughs) I imagine him as, like, super French looking, like, with the mustache. mustache, Yeah. Yeah. And he's just running. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a it's a nice thought it's a nice thought in my yeah. brain so the army arrived and they managed to get things under control and, and agreements were made on the type of food the workers would be served and they were like all right we'll stop rioting but yeah you need to give us you know give, give us, us give us the fucking want. food yeah. that we want at the very least like you know the take you can go in and do all that greatness and not take away their culture like, don't exactly. just come in and colonize. Don't colonize the situation. That's exactly what he was you doing. It's exactly yeah. what he was doing. So uh, along with all that, they also felt that they were treated sort of inhumanely as they were forced to work through the middle of the day under that dangerous tropical sun instead of after sundown and before sunrise as they were used to. So they would frequently refuse to work out of concern for their own well-being. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to die. Health. I'm not going to die for yeah. you in the sun. Like, no, there's no reason why we can't do this at night, you know. Mm -hmm. So if all that wasn't enough, good old Fordlandia had some ridiculously strict rules as well. Their homes were to be extremely organized so as not to attract pests. Tobacco, alcohol, and soccer were forbidden within the town, as were... Soccer? Soccer. Yeah. And I was going to say, as were women, but I, I couldn't... I didn't know if they meant, I think when they said women, they mean like. Ladies of the night. Ladies (laughs) of the night. (laughs) Yes. They were not allowed as well. This place sounds fucking boring. It sounds pretty fucking shitty. Or ladies of the night. No, no. So all that was forbidden, um, including inside the workers' own homes. So it's not like, you know, they couldn't even fucking smoke a cigarette in their own goddamn house you know it wasn't that it was just banned around town they couldn't do it in their own space and they actually had american inspectors who would go through houses and check to ensure that the rules were being followed every now and then in the 1920s i'm surprised because that wasn't a time where i mean smoking was such a huge thing so i'm surprised that yeah and now we're getting closer into like the 30s you know 1930s still But yeah, still, it was a thing. I mean, up up until the fucking I mean, 90s, I was, we were smoking in restaurants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mom, we were always smoking in restaurants. And then you go into the other side where it's like non-smoking, non-smoking but you're still just directly section. in the smoke. Yeah. And Applebee's, yeah. give me the smoking section. It took years yeah. to get that smell out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I actually kind of miss those days. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I miss the smoking. I miss smoking in bars. I I remember smoking my last cigarette in a restaurant and knowing it was the last mm-hmm. one. And it was a surreal moment. But fucking nerds and scientists <laughs> nerds and coming scientists. in again. Like, oh, your health. Everyone else is around you, health. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to smoke, just go to the casino. They'll hook you up. Yes. <laughs> smoke and do some stuff. But slots. even some of the casinos are making them non smoking now. Are they? Yes. Oh, my God. It's gosh. very upsetting. Yeah. That's, that's all that's I... the only time I really smoke. That's because I'm not I'm not a cigarette smoker, but you get me in a casino, I'm throwing down menthols and drinking free soda. It... Like that's my Man, that's my doesn't jam. that sound good right now? I would do right? anything to just hang up the fucking phone right now and be like, I'm gonna meet you at the mm-hmm. casino. <laughs> 
Oh, I can get some menthols and some freaking Mountain Dew. Let's get full free. $50 and quarters and just sit there. And yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Next time, I, next time I come down, <laughs> we're going to go to the casino. Yes. Done. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. So pretty fucking boring town. Um, there were some reports, unverified, but there were some reports about, you know, obviously people smuggling things in and, sp- you know, smuggling mm-hmm alcohol in and and i think there was even a report that they had opened up there was like this tiny little secret town and i don't know if i'd even call it a town but just like a little area a couple of miles away from fordlandia where there was like a little brothel and like you could go there Heck and yeah mm-hmm, get your rocks mm-hmm. off so naturally i mean they sound like they were in fucking hell so <laughs> Now it's time to revisit Henry Ford's extreme lack of knowledge when it comes to rubber cultivation. Because let's remember why we're here. It's to get that rubber. Yep. Get that, that rubber. Got that rubber. So his first and biggest mistake. <laughs> it's hard for me to even get it out because it's so stupid <laughs> and ridiculous. <laughs> Like, I can't believe they put this much money into this place. And I have to read this paragraph. (laughs) The plantation was under the supervision of Ford factory trained men rather than horticultural specialists. (laughs) (laughs) Like, do I even need Uh, to go any further? Yeah. Like, big fail. Big fail. Like, it's like telling some some guy that, like, changes oil to be like, all right, go start a guard. We're going to make millions. (laughs) They know nothing. (laughs) Millions. (laughs) Nothing. It's just wild that they went through all of that and just, all right, let's start there. So obviously this means that they didn't know what the fuck that they were doing. And they acted like they were just planting on Grammy's back garden. They planted these trees way too close together. So in the wild, natural rubber trees grow more apart from each other, and that's on purpose. It's like a protection mechanism against plagues and diseases by things uh, like sava ants, lace bugs, red spiders, leaf caterpillars. Think of okay, so think of these tree blights as like fires essentially. So if one tree is on fire and all the others are planted too close, they're all going to go up in flames, and like super quickly. But if the trees are planted far enough apart, you have a solid chance at either saving or sacrificing like just that one tree. So this is essentially what happened. The trees were just constantly being ravaged by all these fucking insects because these idiots planted them too close together and they just went. It's idiotocracy. It's just like the movie Idiotocracy (laughs) where they're like figuring out why can't the food grow? And it's because having corporations take care of the plants and they're watering them with like that Powerade. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's the exact same thing. It's got extra hydration, baby. It's got to work good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Got them electrolytes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's essentially the same thing that's happening fucking here. Um, along with the trees being totally ravaged, um, the Amazon's heavy rains actually washed out the nutrient-rich soil that was needed for growing the trees on top of all that. So it was really just a perfect recipe for failure. So by 1933, the town is only five years old now. It's still young, but we're five years in now. Mm-hmm. They knew that they had too much trouble with the leaf diseases and the pests. So Ford finally hired a plant pathologist, Dr. James Weir. Five After five years. years. (laughs) Of of just that. Five years, buddy. All right. They had some pride that they didn't want (laughs) to. They needed to set it aside. Be like, we don't know what the fuck we're doing about this rubber. (laughs) So Weir came to survey the land and the surrounding area, and he came to the conclusion that they needed a new property about 80 miles downstream of Fordlandia, where the soil and everything was just better for planting the rubber trees. Oh, yeah. I'd be so pissed. I'd be like, I the built whole this thing. whole town. Whole thing. And thus, oh, a God. new plantation named Belterra was established. Now, Fordlandia wasn't abandoned, but the majority of the plantation operations were transferred to Belterra. But not one drop of latex from Fordlandia ever made it into a Ford car. 
<laughs> after five years, not a fucking oh drop. Oh my gosh. Isn't that insane? Oh Such my god. Such a waste. So by 1940, 500 employees were working at Fordlandia, while 2,500 employees were working over at Belterra. So according to Henry Ford.org's recount of this part of the story, the early success of Belterra partially had to do with Ford being more accommodating to the needs of the natives than at Fordlandia. A former sheriff, Curtis Pringle, you like the Pringles chips? Yum, 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 yum. No, I'm hungry. <laughs> he was hired to manage the plantation and he relaxed the sort of Dearborn style regulations that had been a problem over at Forlandia, um, deferring basically to the local Brazilian customs for meals and entertainment and all the shit that the natives want and are used to. Yeah. So Belterra ended up growing into a successful community. And in 1940, the president of Brazil visited Belteria belterra and actually praised it as a model community so he did something right there with belterra at least <laughs> let's just pretend that fordlandia never existed <laughs> always listen to the native people guys that's what it is always, wherever you are always they yep. live there longer they know how to grow the food better they know what works with houses they know what works with the area you know mm -hmm. it's Yep. That's why so many white people died when they first came to America, too, because they weren't listening to the natives. And then now they just came in all fucking cocky. They don't come in cocky. <laughs> yep. So they learned from their mistakes there. And in 1942, the first commercial tapping of the rubber trees began and 750 tons of latex were produced. Finally. Although this was well short of the 38,000 tons Ford needed annually. Uh, which is quite an understatement. Yeah. Uh, but it was estimated that by 1950, the two plantations would produce that amount. Keyword here is estimated. Yeah. Let's remember that. <laughs> Although Belterra was beginning to pr produce rubber, the new location was still plagued with all that leaf fungus problem. So there, it wasn't just like smooth sailing. It, it was working, but it was mm -hmm. it was tough. It was like a constant battle, essentially. Technicians tried to contain the epidemic through something called bud grafting. And although this approach did work, the start of the Second World War brought on a bunch of other problems that basically impacted the rubber industry. So this is when like the, the rubber boom is happening. Mm -hmm. So 1945, they developed synthetic rubber. The rubber we know and the rubber we love. Yeah. Probably the rubber that's gum. <laughs> so that was developed in 45. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Your gum rubber. Um, and yeah, this is the only <laughs> rubber I know of. Uh, this obviously reduced the world mm -hmm. demand for natural rubber. So there wasn't this huge need for it as there once mm -hmm. was when he first was like, I'm going to build this whole community. So Ford's investment was basically fucked overnight once that happened. Without producing any rubber for Ford's tires, the towns were abandoned. Oh, my gosh. Just like that. Like, boom. They produced the 750 tons of latex. So they succeeded in that. But by the time 1945 came around, like, it, everything was fucked. And they weren't actual, actually able to use any of the latex that they made oh to produce any rubber for Ford tires. I just feel like these meetings, I just want to be in these <laughs> meetings. I feel like every single month it would just be like, and we're fucked again. Co yeah. And <laughs> Complete. We're again. Somebody needed to bring a woman in there to be like, look, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, utter and complete failure. Towns were abandoned. Um, in 1945, Henry Ford's grandson, Henry Ford II, sold the area, compromising both towns, back to the Brazilian government for, guess how much? How much did he buy it for again? It was like something millions, right? It, he invested two million. He invested two million. Okay, so let's just say he invested two million. Okay. So he invested two million. How much do you think he sold the towns back to the Brazilian government for? Ooh, I'm going to do a really low number. Okay. But I don't know. 50000 Okay, yeah, that's too low. Too low. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my thunder. Way too low. <laughs> $250,000. That's really low. It's still fucking yeah. low. It's like... That's super low. It's like a yeah. middle-class house in Minnesota right yeah. now. Yeah. 
That's crazy. It's a lot of acreage. The entire place for two of that. So by the end of all the production, by the time they sold it, it was a loss of over $20 million after everything was built and said and done. And that is equivalent to $338 million by today's standards. Just thrown away. Oh, Henry. Henry, Henry, Henry. Henry. In spite of the huge investment and the numerous invitations he had received, Henry Ford actually never visited either of those towns. So he just made towns and never visited them. Made them, was like, this is how you have to live in these towns. Mm-hmm. Bye. <laughs> That's some baller rich people shit right there. Never stepped a fucking foot <laughs> on it. In the fucking yeah. Amazon. Rich yep. people shit. So despite these towns being abandoned, people actually still live there. It was just Ford that abandoned the town, not the people. Mm-hmm. So, so they fucking pulled out and just left yeah. left the natives there to be like, all right, do what you want to do, I guess. Yeah. So between the 50s and the 70s, the Brazilian Ministry of Agriculture ended up building a few facilities in the area and the houses that once belonged to those Ford rubber tappers were given to the families of the ministry's employees who were descendants of all these employees and they still oh, occupy awesome. them. That's yeah. great. Yeah, there are actually like fourth generation Fordlandians being born to this day. That is fucking amazing. Yeah. That's Fordlandian. Really cool. I'm Fordlandian, bitches. <laughs> I want to see. Yeah, I want to. I need to see these towns. That's really cool. Yeah, and you know when you see these pictures too, like <laughs> there's actually a really great documentary on YouTube. You should watch. I highly recommend it. It's like 45 yeah. minutes. Totally worth it. Mm-hmm. It's not what you're picturing. It was not like. They made it sound like this luxury stuff. There's golf courses and there's a community pool and there's a cinema. It was very like, it felt very like, I was going to say walking dead town, but you've never seen that. Just odd. Just Well, it's hard to get materials there. And if you're trying to build it not native, like you're trying to Americanize it, you're bringing in, you're trying to bring in materials or trying to make it look that way when that's not what the environment has. Yeah. So I could imagine it would probably be weird. It's palpable when you see it and you're like, oh, and even the like supposedly really nice houses that the like the American managers were getting, they were like a 1950s rambler in Brooklyn Center. Like, it was not fancy at all. Like, they made it sound like it was like, these American managers get luxury living. And it's like, you see a picture of it now and you're like, oh my God, okay. They're probably so ignorant thinking, oh, we're going into another country that's not America and they're not as advanced as us. So they're not going to, you know, care as much. or They're just going to be happy they're in these shacks when really they're not great. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that was even like, but the American manager's house, like those were the people that came over from the United States Mm -hmm. that they're like, we're going to put them up in like the nicer ones. And they were just shitty. Like, I I can't believe Mm -hmm. these people even agreed to that. Like, yeah, like I know the natives were pissed, too, but like the Americans I feel like I need to Google that part now too. Like, how like, did they what would feel? You get out? Yeah, how do you get out of it? You probably went there thinking better. You probably went there thinking, "I'm yeah. going to be in a nice, Free beautiful, warm place." Yeah. Free house, like mm-hmm. all this stuff. It sounds like a dream, and then you're. It feels like you're dropped off at <laughs> what is the what is that documentary? The Fire Festival. You know. What oh I'm yeah, about? <laughs> the Fryer. Yes, this is. They give like you a this. cheese, the cheese and bread sandwich. <laughs> yes. This looks exactly. This is. Henry yeah. Ford's Fire Festival. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking nailed it. <laughs> you're um, going there. You're thinking the Jenners are going to be there on a yacht. No. Nope. But then you realize, nope, they're not nope. there. Nope. nope. It's just the fucking natives rioting in the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. So the town's population of Fordlandia was actually about 90 people until the late 2000s. No basic services were offered in the area with medical help only coming by boat. So if you had an emergency, like you were oh, fucked, wow. like it, yeah. they they pulled out mm-hmm. and it was essentially it was essentially a native town again. But yeah, you don't have access the- to the electricity, uh, to the mm-hmm. phones. You just have these buildings and they're like, all right, <laughs> you know, which is insane. Yeah. <sighs> so. 
people started looking for places to live and decided to go back into the town and they started claiming abandoned houses. And this was like after, you know, the late 2000s. Mm -hmm. So they started to claim these houses that were like the, like the, the American managers houses. They'd be like, all right, this is mine now. Yeah. That'd be sweet if you're just like, oh, you can come this, if you just come to a town and you take whatever house you want, just start squatting. I like it. Really? Yeah. Just walking around like, yep, this is mine now. It yep. feels like when you're a kid and you like, you build forts out in the oh, yeah. forest and you're like, this is my corner. This stick between this stick and this stick and this stick <laughs> is mine. This is my yeah. house. This is where my steps start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's real. You can pick your yeah. own. Yeah. I get it. So once that started happening, things started to perk up a little bit. And the town is now a district of, of I'm probably going to say this wrong, Aviero, Aviero, and is home to over 3,000 people. Oh, that's huge now. That happened yes. quick. Yes. Yep. So most of the original buildings are actually still standing, including the old water tower, the sawmill, the workshop, and the American village, which had the five houses that still had uh, like the American managers that still had the original silverware. Um, and they even had like clothes that were left behind when the town was deserted. Oh, they kind of furnished even? I fucking feel furnished, it. fucking ha- clothes and everything. Yep, they just yeah. up and left. They're like, all right, mm-hmm. this project's done. We're going to close the book on this. Just get up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the hospital lasted quite a while, but it was actually dismantled by looters. The good old looters in the late 2000s. So that the hospital is no more. They fucked it all up. Uh, um, and I'm a total, I'm so pro loot because that's like my dream. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to be in a civilization where people are looting, like when everyone's like looting and freaking out. Yeah. But the idea of just getting like go into like a hospital and take whatever I fucking want sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I always or, thought about that for like a mall. Yeah. Yeah. Like you got everything you need. And- grab everything and run out Mm -hmm. oh my god sounds amazing (laughs) yep yep i have always wanted to like i wanted to like spend the night in a mall and like have access to everything like i'm gonna go sleep in the mattress store on the best fucking bed and then i'm gonna go shop for clothes and then i'm gonna go eat some annie ann's pretzels and (laughs) well it's like like the last of us have you you've watched the last of us right yes where they're in the mall exactly i loved that episode but less of the fungi- fungus people. <laughs> yeah, less of the fungus pe- people, for sure. Yes. Um, yeah, that sounds like a dream. But I mean, Fordlandia, that's a, I guess that's a typical, like not a typical, but an ideal situation in which you can loot because it's done anyway. Yeah. Take what take you it. fucking want. Take, you loot know, it. whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's actually, so it's just like a, a super weird, odd looking place. And it looks like a ghost town now. Like even though 3,000 people live there, like with all these buildings still standing, it, it's just eerie looking still. Um, and you just, you got to see these pictures. It's just wild. That is the story of Henry Ford's failed town in the middle of the Amazon. That was amazing. <laughs> Isn't that a fun one? <laughs> that is fun. Fun fact. You guys all know this fun little fact about Henry Ford. <laughs> oh, Henry. Henry. I wonder what the Henry. times, because I know that the Fords, I, I know that it was mi- really ran Detroit, Michigan and all those things. And then when they went away, um, it really destroyed towns. I wonder when that happened. I think that was about, and I could be completely wrong. I feel like that's like the seventies. So kind of after I'm wondering if it was connected with them losing all that money, but that was a lot earlier. (laughs) That's true. It was earlier, but I don't know. It, that, it fucking, it fucking sucks. I mean, a lot of people were saying like, it sucks that he had such a the huge failure in those first five years because he succeeded with Belterra in it. Like if he would have just had some empathy for the natives in the first place, like yes. things would have gone a lot smoother for him those first five years. Now, nothing really would have changed unless he'd immediately hired some horticulture specialists <laughs> right away to figure that shit out instead of just being full of fucking pride and being like, I can do it myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. Like- Again, it's just that Americanized mindset. I wonder, it's like, do you think that, like, European people just came to America and were automatically like that? 
that is such in our culture and blood now. Like even then, like it we're is. so like we don't take other people's culture. We're yeah. so anti like learning about other people or any mm-hmm. like we're just like nope, we're the best. <laughs> yeah, it's really gross. Right. It is gross, and it's, it's weird. And where did it come from? Like who was like who you know. <laughs> It's so funny, too, because, like, I feel like everybody, no matter who you are, you can agree. Nobody liked that kid in school. Nobody liked that kid in school that was, like, a know-it-all and, like, just had this weird cockiness, this air about them. Like, nobody liked that kid. So why do we as a country decide (laughs) that we're going to collectively be that kid, even though we all hate Uh. that fucking kid? (laughs) I get it. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. But crazy. Crazy with the rubber. Yep. But now we crazy are chewing on plastic. Rubber. Yep. But that's amazing. Thank you for yep. that story. You're and welcome. And go on Facebook and Instagram. We'll post lots of pictures of all this stuff. We'll post yep. pictures of the towns, the spaceships, or not spaceships under the water. The, yep. All that type of stuff. The forest. We got, we'll, we'll have it all for you. And Do I'll link, it. we'll link to some some of those videos. Like, like I'll link to the documentary for Fordlandia. Mm-hmm. And uh, Johnny Paranormal's YouTube channel. So Perfect. I'm sure if you're anything like me, you're going to want to start digging into some of this shit because it was just a little taste, you know. A little taste. A little taste. And if you like this, we'll do more of them. Let yeah, we're going to call this one V1, version one of yeah. Odd Places. So there'll be more. Let us know if you dug it. Oh, and should we tell them about what we're thinking after the 30th episode? Just so do we want to bum them out? Well, After such a high? Oh, well, I think we should. Just so they're getting right. used to it. So we talked, and we want to make sure that we always give you the best, highest quality podcast we can. Um, you know that I like. we both like to do research, and we both like to make sure that um, – you know, we're not rushed in mm-hmm. giving you that and that we make every episode as good as possible. So we decided was instead of doing weekly starting after the 30th episode that we're thinking about trying out bi-weekly for a while and seeing if that will do great for our schedules and make sure that we're able to, you know, give you the best quality possible. For sure. Um, I it, It's bittersweet. You know, Mm -hmm. I love having this weekly time, you Mm -hmm. know, with everybody. But we I mean, we're moms. We got full time gigs being mothers. We got jobs. Mm -hmm. We got sanctuaries like we're fucking busy. Yeah. And cramming all this high ass quality content into a few days every week. is It's a lot. We don't want to rush it on you guys. Yeah. Because that's not fair because we love doing this and Mm -hmm. we want to keep loving doing it, too. Yes, we don't want to burn out. We don't Mm want to, you know, be done anytime soon. And I think we both just feel like this is the right approach at the moment. This is Mm -hmm. not to say that this is a permanent thing. We're going to see how it goes. Um, I think it's going to be great for us. And I'm sure we'll sprinkle in some surprises here and there. You never Mm -hmm. know. We like doing shit like that. Um, But yeah, we're going to give it a try. So we're sorry if that bums you out. But on on a hopeful note if you guys absolutely hate this plan and are about to revolt and riot like the natives in fordlandia about it um we're not we're not living in our culture (laughs) you can you can let us know and you can let us know if you might be interested in us going to maybe like a patreon sort of platform Mm -hmm. where we do a monthly subscription and we can start monetizing a little bit so that we can build out just more time for this for you guys. So absolutely. We'll talk yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. This is all up to all of us. We're all in this together. <laughs> yes. So, yep. yeah. But we'll start after the 30th and 30th episode. And yeah, we'll just figure out what works best for everybody. Yep. And maybe you'll like that. Maybe you'll be like, you know what? It sucks. It's every other week. But the quality is getting better or you know it might be better for you mm-hmm. might the stories, stories might be better. could be filling out more because we've got more time to research and mm-hmm. and you know read like right now things are so packed into our schedule that sometimes like i don't even have a chance to rewrite everything that i wrote all of my notes i don't 
I ha- haven't had it, you know, and I just have to, we just have to fucking go because we don't have enough time, you know. And you know me, so, like, I research like crazy and I get really upset when I, like, even during Bermuda Trip, I'm like, I want to add so much more. I want to do so much more. But it's like you mm-hmm. try to, oh, yep. so maybe we'll see what happens. Who knows? Maybe our, maybe our new episodes will be fucking three hours long. It's very possible. So yeah. you'll end up maybe getting a little more. Just or maybe it'll be the worst when we go back. But we're just trying to warn you. We're just trying to warn you. We didn't want to just throw it at you. You got time. We got a little time. Um, But yeah, it would. It things things are exciting. I'm excited to spend more time Mm -hmm. on episodes and research. Um, And if you guys want more, it would. You know, it'd be great if we talked about just. You know. Let's let's get some order some merch, do some Patreon mm-hmm. stuff. Let's go. Let's give us start, five stars. Give us five stars. We gotta we gotta keep this train moving because at some point it all slows down a little bit, and I'm not ready to slow down. No, it may seem like we're ready because we're like we're doing every other episode, but it's really mm-hmm. for the opposite reason. Like, yeah, you know, absolutely. So. Yeah, so give us love. Let us know, and we will. We're gonna keep doing this. So, <laughs> yep. yeah, we're here. Yeah. We're here. So hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm excited to start writing up V2 for this one. Um, Me too. Check out our website. Check out our merch. Give us five stars. Send us a message. Tell us how your day is. Yep, We're here. (laughs) We love it all. Yep. (laughs) So I don't know. What do you say? Should we get weird with them next Sunday? We should. All right. Let's do it. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Until next time, this has been Nicole and Denny with Girls Gone Weird. (laughs) Girls Gone Weird. Girls Gone Weird!